Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the Department of Medicine Grand Rounds. Today, we're um, joined by Kat Dr. Catherine uh, Lyons um, to have a talk up with the topic of anti-obesity medication therapy and a pragmatic approach. Dr. Lyons completed her residency in, um, in the University Hospital's VA Internal Medicine Center of Excellence track in 2019 and then joined Metro Health Weight Loss Surgery Weight Management Center as an obesity medicine um, specialist. She started in the Metro Health Obesity Medicine Fellowship in she started the fellowship in 2021 and has been working on system-wide initiatives to improve evidence-based obesity medicine education for medical students, trainees, and faculty. She is passionate about improving access to obesity medicine care and empowering patients to create healthy lifestyles to reverse and prevent chronic diseases. Please welcome please help me welcome Dr. Lyons. Thank you very much. All right. Well, welcome to everyone who is here in person and on the Zoom. Um, if at any point um, for our Zoom co folks there's issues with sound quality at all, just let me know. Um, and uh, we have somebody watching the chat for that. Um, to everybody who is here in person, I appreciate you guys um, coming out. Um, and I am very excited to, um, to be here today. Um, so we're going to be talking about anti-obesity medication therapy. Um, and really what my goal is is to help, um, help you walk away today with an idea of what we are doing in a real-world sense um, to help patients get these medications when appropriate, um, taking into account availability and affordability of these medicines. Um, and so, whoops, all right, sorry. I have nothing, no disclosures. Um, I do want to let you know, we are going to talk a little bit about the brand name medications today. I'm going to try to utilize the generic names as much as possible. Um, and these are our learning objectives. So I'm going to try to help you understand the role of medication therapy in treating obesity and metabolic disease. We're going to outline the FDA-approved medication therapies for obesity. And we're going to also talk through the limitations of prescribing some of those medications. Um, and then we're also going to talk about the off-label medication therapies and really what a pragmatic approach to prescribing these medications is. So I really want to help you understand what are we doing in a real-world sense um, for, these, for, uh, you know, for treating obesity with medication therapy. Um, if you're more of an outline person, we're going to talk about why should we care about treating obesity, obesity as a chronic disease, the role of medications, and then the current treatments. Um, so first, I just want to start off with kind of, I get the question a lot, um, you know, how did you end up in this field? What brought you to becoming an obesity medicine specialist? Um, at this point in time, it's definitely more of a niche area. Uh, and so I've had a personal interest in the disease of obesity for a long time. I have a strong family history of it. Um, and so got a lot of exposure to different types of diet culture growing up and really saw firsthand how um, we were relying on this kind of layperson knowledge and, and a lot of popular culture to try to treat uh, something that's actually a disease process, and it wasn't working super great. Um, and then as I came into my training in, um, in residency, I started to see how weight bias and stigma really permeates not only society, but actually extends into the medical field, and that impacts our patient's ability to get care for this disease. Um, from just an interest perspective, Obesity drives a lot of other chronic diseases that we see, and it really increases that overall patient complexity. Um, I love this field because it provides the opportunity to combine medical knowledge with health coaching and really working in an incremental care model um, to help patients build lives that are empowering for them and really um, you know, help them to be healthier and live more active and fulfilled lives. So it's a fantastic field. Um, if you are somebody who really likes utilizing kind of that complex medical knowledge with some coaching skills, um, working with patients in a longitudinal manner, it might be a great field for you. Um, so there's a couple different ways you can get into obesity medicine. We have um, now 22 um, accredited, um, or sorry, non-ACGME accredited fellowships that uh, each run about a year. Um, or you can do a 60-hour CME pass. At the end of both, you would sit for the American Board of Obesity Medicine Boards. Um, and then once you're certified, you're considered a diplomat. Um, and if you're interested in this, you can go to abom.org um, to learn more about it. Um, if you're looking for a physician who is a certified diplomat, you can also find a list of them there. 
Um, and a little bit about our fellowship. So we started, um, we had our inaugural fellow in 2021. We're grant funded through something known as the Obesity Medicine Fellowship Council. Um, and really our goal is to provide a year-long fellowship in clinical obesity medicine. We have a particular focus in health disparities and population health research um, over at Metro Health. And uh, because of our close affiliation with a lot of the subspecialty departments within our hospital, we're able to provide a fairly robust experience for our fellows. So they get to work with the bariatric surgeons, bariatric psychology, nutrition, um, and a wide variety of other related subspecialties that are taking care of our patients. Um, if you have any interest in learning more about the fellowship or uh, potentially applying, my email is at the end of this. And then we also have a website you can go to for more information. This is a picture of our, our a lot of our team here. It's a, actually an older picture. Um, we haven't been able to really get together uh, collectively since the pandemic, but this was shortly before the pandemic in 2019 at our national conference. Um, so I want to start with a patient case. So this is a, um, a patient of mine I've been following for a while. I've gotten to know him really well. His name's Mr. G. Um, he's a 54-year-old male. He has class 3 obesity. So initial BMI when he started with us was around 54. Um, he's got a history of hypertension, depression, sleep apnea, atrial fibrillation, type 2 diabetes, and some pretty severe knee arthritis. So he never really struggled with weight until he was around 33 years old when he started having a lot more life stress, job stress, um, and started gaining and really gained pretty quickly um, and, and ended up at a peak weight of 403 pounds around um, age 51. Um, and you know, he has a strong family history of, of obesity as well and then a lot of um, cultural and social factors that really were promoting this weight gain. So he had already lost some weight, about 35 pounds when he came to see me. It was about, um, you know, almost 9% weight loss. Just through exercise, as much as he could, it was fairly limited, but really changing his eating habits. Um, and his main struggles, he really had an excessive appetite. So he would describe to me how he could eat a full meal with lots of vegetables, lots of proteins, um, and 30 minutes, 45 minutes later, he was hungry for another meal. He just couldn't get satisfied. Um, he struggled a lot with binge eating that was related to stress, work stress, home stress. Um, he skipped a lot of meals as well when he would get busy with work. Um, was drinking a lot of soda when we first met, three to four cans of regular soda per day, um, and really not doing a lot of vegetables still, even with the nutrition changes he had implemented. Um, and his exercise, his, he was pretty sedentary, um, pretty limited because of his knee pain, and then um, he also struggled intermittently with depression. Um, and so he had tried a lot of different things. He had done Weight Watchers. He had done Physicians Weight Loss. Um, he had worked with personal trainers. He had worked with health coaches. He had been on Fentramine in the past, which is a stimulant medication. Um, and he did lose some weight with that, but he would end up, no matter what, regaining. And overall, his weight would typically tend to increase over time. So when we met, he had already decided he wanted bariatric surgery and was going for a bariatric surgery evaluation. And the surgeons told him he needed to get to a goal weight of 340, which was about a 40-pound weight loss at that time. Um, and so uh, he needed, that was about 10.5% that he needed to achieve to qualify for surgery. So I want to just give you a sense of what we did overall from a big picture perspective using medications to get him to this goal. Um, and this is just one example. There's a lot of different regimens we can come up with, but this is one example that we, um, you know, that we utilized to really get him to where he needed to be to get his, his surgery. So we started him off with a GLP-1 receptor agonist, um, liraglutide. He got up to um, just a couple steps beyond the starting dose, but because he was doing so many carbohydrates still, he was having a ton of nausea. So we had to back off of that. Instead, we switched him to topiramate to address his cravings. Um, and that, that worked initially, as you can see, his weight kind of starts to come down here. Um, and then from there, because his nutrition was better, um, the weight actually does pop back up for a little bit, but we were able to add back in that GLP-1 receptor agonist. And that's really where you start to see his weight loss take off. Um, in between there, we also got him on some treatment for his depression. Um, mood started to be a bit better. He was having more energy. Um, and he did fantastic for a while. Um, some things changed with work and some home stress, and the weight started to creep back up again. So we switched him from um, liraglutide to semaglutide, and he started to come back down again. And he is now um, at a 66-pound weight loss, which is about 16% 
since we started the medication therapy in addition to the 35 he had already lost before. Um, and so he is actually scheduled for a bariatric surgery a couple months from now. So um, he is doing fantastic, quite a success story. And this is just an example of kind of how we use medications over time um, to really impact the chronic disease of obesity. So I think it's helpful to talk about what is obesity? Um, because the concept of obesity as a disease is actually newer. Um, you know, only in the past 10 years or so have we really started to accept this as a medical community. And so obesity is a disease of um, adipocyte dysregulation that leads to um, more wider spread hormonal dysregulation. And it is chronic it is relapsing, and it is multifactorial. And so because it is a chronic disease, it requires ongoing treatment. Um, it's not enough to just treat it for a few months at a time and you know, to tell the patient, all right, you lost some weight, you're cured, go back to doing whatever. Whatever we're doing for this, it really needs to be continued over the lifespan. Um, and it is not a problem that is going anywhere anytime soon. So um, this is 2015 data. It's a little old at this point. Um, but the, um, the current data matches this. So uh, it is a significant problem. Um, around 65 to 70% of folks struggle with overweight or obesity, depending on um, you know, which numbers you're looking at, but significant portion of the population affected by obesity. Um, and when we talk about obesity and metabolic disease, I think it's important to discuss how we assess disease severity. Most of us are probably pretty familiar with the concept of using BMI. Um, and, you know, BMI can be great. Um, it, it really can um, be a, a quick framework to reference. However, it's really a measurement. BMI does not necessarily equate disease severity. The one point I want to make is, um, from a jargon perspective, we have moved away from using the term morbid obesity. The majority of patients find that to be pretty offensive language. Um, so we tend to talk about obesity classes, um, either overweight, class one, class two, or class three. Um, and the challenge with BMI, it is fairly limited. It was originally developed for Caucasian males. Um, so we find that um, you know, for populations with females, specifically minority populations, um, certain ethnicities, we know that you know, folks who are of South Asian ancestry tend to develop metabolic disease at lower BMIs. Um, you know, that in the elderly, it might not tell the whole story. There might be sarcopenia or other things going on, even though they might have a normal BMI. Um, and then we also know that for folks who have a BMI of 25 to 35, it is especially poor at encapsulating health risk. Um, and so I think it's helpful to first start thinking about what are these other factors that really quantify metabolic disease, um, and starting there and then really branching out when we think about disease severity. So the, the different things we look at when we're looking at um, diagnostic criteria for metabolic syndrome are the presence of abdo abdominal adiposity, uh, because that's where a lot of these um, you know, inflammatory mediators are coming from. Um, we look at lipid dysregulation, hypertriglyceridemia, hypertension, and then also the presence of insulin resistance and glycemic dysregulation. Um, so that's a good start, but I think it's also important to look at the associated comorbidities that can come as a result of this um, widespread hormonal dysregulation and chronic inflammation. Um, and so taking into account, um, you know, the presence or absence of things like depression, arthritis, sleep apnea, polycystic ovarian syndrome, all um, comorbidities that can really drive that chronic disease of obesity. Um, also looking at things like the presence of CKD, gynecologic malignancies, fatty liver disease, cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, uh, because those are all going to play into the course of how this patient does over time. Um, and I think a fantastic tool for really quantifying the disease severity in obesity is the Edmonton Obesity Staging System. And so um, five different stages, starting from stage zero, um, where we really have pretty um, non-existent impairment. Um, you know, folks are overall pretty healthy, doing pretty well. Um, and then as you advance through the stages, it looks at impairment in domains of medical, mental, and functional impairment. And so stage one is really where you're going to start to see just those preclinical 
clinical risk factors. You know, maybe some um, dis mild dyslipidemia, some prehypertension, prediabetes. Overall, the patient is still doing pretty well. As we move into stage two, this is where we start to see the development of full-blown comorbidities, type 2 diabetes, fatty liver disease, sleep apnea, um, and some moderate, um, moderate impairment in, in um, you know, mental status and day-to-day -day functioning. Um, so maybe this is your patient who's not able to do um, as many things as they would like to because of their weight. Um, stage three is when we start to see end organ damage. So this is your Nash cirrhosis. We're seeing complications of type 2 diabetes, um, heart failure at this point, and more severe uh, mental and functional impairments. So this is when patients are just really having a hard time doing their day-to-day -day things because of their weight and their metabolic disease. And then as we get into stage four, this is really end-stage obesity. Uh, Stage four, when folks get here, it can be tough to treat. A lot of times they have multi-system organ failure that precludes them from being a candidate for a lot of medications or for surgery. Um, at this point, a lot of folks tend to lose mobility because of their overall comorbidities and disease severity. Um, so once we get to stage four, it's, it's fairly difficult, um, and it's much easier if we're able to intervene earlier on. And so the great thing about the Edmonton staging system is it actually is a much better predictor of BMI, of uh, mortality than BMI is alone. And so from the NHANES data, um, over here on the left, they have uh, mortality data based on just BMI. Um, and then on the right, it's the mortality data actually based on that Edmonton um, staging system. And as we can see, as we move up in stages, there is a decrease in proportion survival. Um, and this holds true even independent of BMI class. So when they break patients up by BMI class, we see that that relationship between um, Edmonton st uh, staging score and mortality still holds true. So I just want to emphasize um, how difficult it is for patients when they're trying to really figure out where to start with addressing their obesity and metabolic disease. Um, I always talk to patients about what is actually within their control as opposed to what is not within their control um, because I think a lot of folks hear this narrative that you should be in control of your eating, you should be in control of your activity, you should be able to control your weight. And that is just not biologically realistic. And so I do a lot of myth debunking for patients. Um, this is a fantastic diagram that shows, it's not even completely comprehensive, but it shows all the different things that contribute to energy storage. A lot of these patients have maybe some control over the things that they eat, how much they move, how well they're treating their other related comorbidities that could be influencing their weight. Um, but even that, we're starting to learn, is largely dictated by environment, by genetics, by brain chemistry. And so um, we really have to utilize all the tools in our toolbox because this is not a matter of willpower, um, and obesity is not a disease that occurred because you didn't have willpower. Um, so we really have to help patients navigate this because it is such a challenging disease to treat. And the other challenging factor of this is just we are very biologically wired to exist in an energy balance state that favors energy storage. Um, there are so many different mechanisms. We have, I guarantee there are, we're going to find out in the next 10 years or so that there are even more contributing to this. Um, but everything from different neuroendocrine pathways, our dopamine reward system, um, you know, the fact that um, when we do lose weight, our bodies tend to conserve energy and try to make us regain weight. So we are fighting an uphill battle with this. Um, and we are really wired to gain weight over time and continue to gain weight. And we are wired against weight loss. So when we talk about obesity treatment, um, and our goals for a patient. These really should be individualized based on the patient, um, the disease severity, and then their medical comorbidities. Um, and I often draw the analogy to kind of, you know, our A1C treatment goals and type 2 diabetes, very similar concept. Um, on average, our initial that we're going for to just, if we're just trying to improve comorbidities, we have data that show that 5 to 10 percent weight loss is a great place to start. Some people are going to be more, need more than that, um, depending on what they have going on, but 5 to 10% is a great starting spot. Um, there is also, we know, some evidence that if we can get um, female patients under a BMI of 40 and male patients under a BMI of 35, there is a significant drop in their overall mortality risk. So uh, that is something often we will be aiming for as well. The other things I take into account is their weight history. If you've had someone 
who is already defending a 100, 200 pound weight loss, it's gonna be a lot harder to get them to continue to lose weight and maybe we should focus more on preventing weight regain. Um, you know, if you have someone who really struggles with maintaining lean body mass, um, you know, we might want to hold off on actually having them lose more weight and lose more lean body mass and first work on building some muscle mass uh, before we move forward with further weight loss goals. Um, they should be individualized by age. So we know especially for folks who are in the 65 and up category, um, we tend to prefer that they set at a slightly higher BMI of 26 to 29.9. Um, a lot of times we will, you know, be seeing patients um, around a surgery, and so we talk a lot about what is the desired BMI for surgical risk reduction, and then also patient preference, although um, I think our patients are very hard on themselves, so a lot of times, more often than not, I get folks who come in and tell me that they're trying to lose somewhere in the range of 30 to 50 percent of their actual body weight, which um, we're going to talk through it actually would exceed the typical numbers we see even with bariatric surgery. So I talk to a lot of patients about what is realistic and what is biologically feasible for them for weight loss. Um, and so this is just showing that um, if we get to that 5% weight loss, we start to see improvement in these metabolic um, you know, factors, so improvement of A1C, blood pressure, cholesterol. The more weight we lose, the better these are going to get. And so when we conceptualize obesity treatment, um, I love this tool, the obesity treatment pyramid. Uh, I think I use it frequently in the office of patients, um, either drawing it out or pulling a picture up online. Um, and it really helps patients, I think, understand how we're, we are layering therapy and there are tiers to therapy and how we approach this. And so if we're starting with lifestyle modification, um, the evidence shows that on average, most folks are only gonna probably lose about five to 10% long term. Uh, this is very contrary, I think, to what most people believe to be true. I think they think that if I improve my diet and I exercise a lot, I can have essentially infinite weight loss down to this ideal BMI. It is simply not true. Um, we can add medications to that, so utilizing pharmacotherapy, which we're going to talk in great detail about today, um, and that can give us an additional edge. We can push that. Um, some folks still may only end up in that 5 to 10 percent range, but sometimes we can push it on average to 15 percent. With the newer agents, um, specifically semaglutide, um, we're able to push that sometimes even to the 20 percent range. So um, the newer GLP-1 receptor agonists have really opened the doors for us in this area, um, and they continue to get better and better, and we're going to talk a bit about that. Now, for folks who are solidly in that 20 to 35 percent range, Bariatric surgery really is the way to go if they are a candidate. Um, so if they have a body mass index of over 40 or over 35 with a related comorbidity, type 2 diabetes, sleep apnea, um, knee arthritis, or arthritis in a weight-bearing joint, uncontrolled hypertension, or CAD, um, because bariatric surgery is going to get you the most definitive long-term weight loss and it is also going to get you the most definitive improvement in those related comorbidities. So um, that's something I think a lot of patients don't hear about early enough. Um, they're not quite sure where surgery sits in. So uh, you know, I do um, both medical management, but I also work a lot with preparing our patients for surgery and following them afterwards. Um, and and uh, bariatric surgery can be an amazing option for some patients. Um, so this is how I think um, comprehensively about structuring an obesity treatment plan, and we are not going to talk um, in detail about all these today, um, but I want to stress that it should include nutrition recommendations, activity recommendations, behavioral therapy to help patients implement those. Um, we need to be treating the related medical comorbidities, especially ones that are preventing weight loss medication therapy, which we're going to talk about today, bariatric surgery when appropriate, and then lifelong monitoring and follow-up. And it's really important to actually help the patient build tools around lifelong monitoring and follow-up so that they can become the expert in that for themselves. Um, so just a couple thoughts around starting treatment, stopping treatment. So when should we start anti-obesity medication therapy? Um, they're really, it's an adjunctive treatment in addition to that base of lifestyle changes. Um, and so we're adding it to a pre-existing regimen of nutrition, exercise, and behavior change. Um, and it, medication therapy is indicated for folks with a body mass index over 30 or over 27 if you have a related comorbidity. And I usually think about picking an agent that is targeting a specific symptom a lot of the time. So um, I ask patients when we do our initial intake about, you know, excess appetite, do they have food cravings, binge eating, emotional eating, um, and so we can really pick a medication that more or less will target this and get them an improvement in that symptom to help facilitate those nutrition changes. 
The other thing I want to stress, um, like I was saying before, these are chronic medications. So I talk to patients a lot about that up front. Once we start a medication, we're going to try to continue it um, as long as we can, provided that it's tolerated and they're having a good response. Uh, because once we stop it, there's a good chance that most of that weight will come back on. Um, and so, as I mentioned, it's important to be realistic about the amount of weight loss we can achieve for patients with medical management. Um, and then if they really, if you feel that they're really in a range where they need, you know, more extensive weight loss than that referral for bariatric surgery early on. So, um, when we start medicines, um, you know, we're thinking about kind of using them for a specific treatment. When we're evaluating them um, for a response and considering whether to continue or, or stop, we really look for most of the medications um, at around that three-month mark have people achieved a 5% weight loss. Um, some of the newer medications, the GLP-1, specifically liraglutide, um, it is recommended to actually evaluate that a little bit later at four months. Um, and then even the newer GLP-1s, there haven't been a lot of formal recommendations about that. I'm sure they are going to be coming. It's just that initial onboarding for those medications is a little bit slower. Um, so it's probably more realistic to look at the five or six month mark and see what the response is at that point. Um, I also, you know, if a patient has a, obviously a safety or tolerability issue, um, but also if it's really not having the desired effect, um, we might stop it, specifically in areas of like binge eating, craving and appetite. The other thing, the, the converse of that is true as well. So even if a patient doesn't lose 5%, but they're having a specific um, symptom that is significantly improved with this medication, I may consider continuing it as well um, in, in that setting. And then I just want to stress, if you're stopping a medication, make sure you are doing something else to continue treatment. So don't just stop a medication and tell patients, okay, good luck. Um, you really want to either intensify lifestyle changes, switch to an alternative medication, or um, get them uh, you know, started along the path for bariatric surgery. Um, so in terms of how long, as I mentioned, we try to continue these indefinitely. Um, we also do a lot with layering medication. So um, if a patient hits a plateau that's really within that expected weight loss range, a lot of times we'll add another agent. Um, and you know, I think that this is uh, very different. This kind of concept of, of layering and multi-medication regimens is very different from what I have ever seen as a, a resident. I saw you know, kind of things um, uh, you know, utilizing one medication at a time, and if we didn't get effective, we would switch. But really, um, we do a lot of adding medications on once a patient really reaches the maximal effect of a medication um, to get them to that goal weight. Um, so I, again, I just want to stress that obesity is chronic. We need that ongoing treatment for it. And once weight loss is achieved, the resting metabolic rate is going to drop and really fight patients in maintaining that weight loss. Their, their body is going to try to regain the weight. So this is just a, a fairly comprehensive list, I would say, of the different therapies that help with weight loss. Um, we're not going to talk about all these today. I'm going to highlight the more frequently used ones, the more interesting ones. Um, I did you know a lot of these are also, they're actually type 2 diabetes medications that also have a um, weight loss effect. And so we utilize those heavily. So our first medication we're going to talk about is fentramine and topiramate extended release. So this is branded as Qsimia, which you may or may not have heard of. Um, but the two component parts, fentramine is a sympathomimetic um, amine, which is a stimulant medication that results in increased metabolic rate and appetite suppression. Topiramate is a neurotropic medication, lots of different effects, um, GABA pathways, glutamate receptors. Overall impact is that we see a reduction of appetite and we see some changes in taste preference. So um, there are four different doses um, for Qsimia, and it's a, a Q2 week titration that we cycle patients through. Um, the challenge is it's not covered by most insurance plans. It can be pretty expensive. There is prescription assistance, but it's still $98 a month. And if you think about your, you know, patients are taking these medications long term, you're committing somebody to $1,200 a year um, to pay for this medication, which can be pretty pricey depending on their economic status. Um, and so the other caveat with this is because the Qsimia is a controlled substance, um, Patients have to be seen every 30 days face-to-face -face per Ohio law, which if you're talking somebody who works or, you know, has other obligations, it's hard to get folks in that frequently. Um, so a lot of times um, what we'll do is we'll break it down into the component parts, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Uh, but this is just the, these are the data from three major um, year-long studies that were looking at the, the outcomes with the combined fentramine and topiramate extended release formulation. And so we can see that there is an, um, as we increase dosing, we see an increased weight loss response. 
um, you know, and our average ends up in about a 10% weight loss range, which is pretty good. You know, for if, if patients are able to afford it, um, if they're able to come for the follow-ups and stay on it long-term, um, you know, 10% um, is enough to really improve those related metabolic comorbidities. So in terms of breaking it into the component parts, this is what we do more often than not because the components are a lot cheaper than the $98 a month even through prescription assistance. Um, so we utilize a decent bit of topiramate. Um, it is, you know, an older med, tried and true. Um, there was a great 2012 meta-analysis that looked at 10 different RCTs of topiramate versus placebo. On average, we saw about a 4 to 6% weight loss um, with long-term use. Um, and the number needed to treat to get that 5% weight loss was 2.53. Um, and so when we compare it to placebo, we see on average about 5.3 kilos more weight loss in that treatment are compared to placebo. So it does have an impact on weight for patients. Um, the biggest limitations with it are really the side effects, I would say. People can get a lot of cognitive side effects with it, paresthesias, memory issues, GI side effects as well. Um, so that makes it a more challenging medication to use. It's also teratogenic, so not great for your um, female patients of childbearing age. I usually try to avoid it unless they're on a pretty definitive, reliable method of um, contraception. Um, the, some of the pros of it, so there's a lot of dual purpose use. Migraine, if a patient has migraine, seizure, pseudotumor, um, it can help with all of those. It is fantastic for binge eating disorder. So um, I end up having a lot of patients in my clinic who kind of had binge eating disorder that slipped under the radar, um, and, and topiramate can be a great medication option for them. Um, I just want to make a note that, you know, if you can't get folks to tolerate the topiramate because of cognitive side effects or other issues, we often will try zanisamide as well. Um, it's been well studied. You know, it's an effective alternative to topiramate. Definitely not as widely used, but there's a lot of evidence looking at the combination between zanisamide and bupropion. So that's, that's another medication combination we'll get patients on. Um, now, centromine is the other component of the Qsimia. Um, it's really classified as short-term therapy. The FDA approval for it is only about 12, it's 12 weeks long. There are states where you can use it longer off-label. Um, Ohio is not one of them. We are limited by state law here for only 12 weeks. Interestingly enough, centromine is to date the most widely prescribed weight loss medication. Um, you know, it's fairly cheap. Patients can get it from anywhere from about $20 to $40 a month. Um, the challenge is just that often once we stop the medication after the 12 weeks, patients typically regain the weight. And so um, we see a pretty significant rebound effect with that. Um, the challenge is it has not necessarily always been borne out in studies. People, there haven't been a lot of, a lot of analyses done after med discontinuation. Um, so that's really an anecdotal phenomenon that we're seeing in our patient population. Um, now, when uh, the meta-analysis that looked at six different studies with durations of 12 to 24 weeks, we do see that um, the fentramine gives us an additional 3.6 kilos of weight loss compared to placebo. Again, the challenge is most patients will just regain that once they come off the medication. Um, in terms of actually utilizing it, so there's um, doses in 8, 15, and 37.5 milligram tablets. The 37.5 milligram tablet is the cheapest. That's what I tend to use the most of. So we usually start with a half tab for one week and then increase to a full tab daily. You can do the 15 BID, you can do the 8 TID now. Those tend to be more expensive, so I use the 37.5. And when folks are on this, you just want to be mindful watching for, you know, increased heart rate, increased blood pressure. Um, most common side effects are dry mouth and constipation, so I just make sure that people are carrying a water bottle with them during the day. Um, so the next medication um, is naltrexone and bupropion. Um, it is under the brand, sold under the brand name Contrave. Uh, very interesting medication combination. Um, it activates the, um, the, it works along the alpha MSH pathway to activate the MC4 receptor um, to decrease appetite, but then also has this craving reduction effect via the mesolimbic reward system. So we're acting in two different areas, and it can really, for folks who struggle with emotional eating or cravings, this can be such a fantastic medication. Um, the main data for, for um, naltrexone and bupropion comes from the core study. So there are a few different iterations of this. Um, the majority of them ran for 56 weeks, so I have the, the data for core one here and then the core B mod. Um, so core one was looking at just naltrexone bupropion versus placebo. And so what we saw is that uh, there's a, a, a difference in terms of weight loss with the treatment arm, so 5.4% weight loss versus 1.3% in placebo, so we do get some extra weight loss, and then 42 versus 17% in placebo who achieved at least a 5% reduction of their initial body weight. 
Now, I like the, I think the Corbimod trial is fairly interesting because it combined the treatment with an intensive behavioral um, intervention. And so made it a little bit more real life to what we're trying to do with patients in clinic. And we see that in the treatment arm, we actually get 9.3% weight reduction as opposed to 5.1% in the placebo. Um, and 57% of folks getting that 5% reduction in body weight with the treatment arm. The other thing I just want to mention, bupropion monotherapy has been studied for folks who maybe can't be on naltrexone for, you know, if they're, if they're on chronic opioids or other reasons. Um, and so we do see some modest weight loss, about 4.4 kilos with year-long use of bupropion alone. Um, now, in terms of practical prescribing for this, again, the Contrave um, branded prescription can be expensive, $99. You can go through prescription assistance for this. If you just do out-of-pocket good RX, it's about $200. Um, the insurance will usually cover the generics. So that's what I use a lot of. Um, so our contrary dosing is 8 milligrams of naltrexone with the SR bupropion 90 milligrams. And we start off with one pill daily, and then over four weeks, we increase up to two pills twice a day. Um, so we try to mimic that. Um, I usually start with the XL version of bupropion. I find it just tends to be a little bit better tolerated for patients. So I'll start with 150 daily initially, and then I'll add that naltrexone 50 milligram tablet. We start with a half pill and then go up to a full pill the next week. Um, and over time, if folks need a little bit more bupropion, we'll increase up to the 300. Sometimes I will use the SR if it's something patients are already on, if they've been on it before and have done well, um, or if there is some concern about doing the XL with absorption. Um, naltrexone bupropion is, like I said, great for cravings. Uh, the naltrexone component is great for that patient who is, you know, maybe trying to cut out um, some alcohol or cut back on alcohol to help facilitate weight loss. Um, the bupropion is great for the comorbid depression or ADHD that we often see in our patients. Um, and the other kind of nuanced point I want to make is with the naltrexone, the interesting thing we've um, seen in the alcohol use literature is some folks will have a significantly improved response in cravings if we increase from the 50 to 100 milligram dosing. Um, it has not been studied specifically for weight loss, but if I get someone who's already on 300 of bupropion and they just need a, they feel like they need a little bit more craving suppression, they've had a good response with the naltrexone, a lot of times I'll increase that up to the 100. Um, for that, I usually split it, though, into two 50-milligram doses. So I'll dose one first thing in the morning and the second one at 2 p.m. just to get patients through that kind of evening hours where they tend to do a lot of craving and snacking. So I just want to briefly touch on Orlistat. It is not very widely used at this point. Tons of GI issues. I have three patients in my practice who have been on it. They are all patients with a chronic constipation, and I think they're more on the Orlistat for that treatment more than the actual weight loss benefit. Um, but it, it's a medication that um, inhibits gastric and pancreatic lipase to cause fecal fat excretion. Um, it does help. We get some modest weight loss results, but very limited, um, you know, for folks who have jobs and can't be going to the bathroom, um, you know, kind of at a whim. Um, so the dosing is 120 milligrams three times a day. You're supposed to take it with meals. And um, the cheapest way to purchase it is actually just buying the two boxes a month of over-the-counter Ally. Um, that gets you about, it's about $130 a month, depending on where you purchase it. I think Costco is actually the cheapest currently. The last, I checked a couple of weeks ago for a patient. That was the, the cheapest current location. Um, and so um, they would just take two of those 60-milligram capsules three times a day. Um, the Ally is a half dose compared to the actual prescription Zenical, which is a 120-milligram uh, capsule. Um, so, again, we're not using it a whole lot at this point in time, especially with the advent of the GLP-1 receptor agonist. Um, I just want to take a minute to briefly mention there's um, this new Gelasys 100. It's under the brand name Plenity. Very interesting medication. It is a um, citric acid cellulose binding resin that is an oral hydrogel. It essentially takes up space in the stomach. So how it's dosed is you take it with 16 ounces of water um, 30 minutes before lunch and dinner. Um, and they did see some initial, um, so this is the, some of their initial, the GLOW study um, looking at this, and they saw that, um, you know, 6.4% weight loss compared to 4.3 in placebo. So they are seeing um, some decent outcomes. Again, it's expensive. It's about $98 a month. You have to fill it through their mail order pharmacy as well. Um, I've only had one patient on this. She was on it for a month or two and then stopped because of um, abdominal bloating and some, some discomfort, unfortunately, which are the main side effects in this study. So GLP-1 receptor agonists are um, a very exciting, um, you know, addition to our repertoire. They are really the current movers and shakers in our, um, you know, kind of our armamentarium of medications. 
Um, so a little bit about GLP-1, it's an incretin hormone that comes from the distal ileum and the colon. And really how it functions is it delays gastric emptying, it improves satiety, um, and it also helps with uh, glycemic regulation by inhibiting glucagon release, um, and then also improving insulin secretion um, in response to glucose loads. And so what this functionally allows patients to do is to reduce portion sizes, eat less frequently, and it really is going to reinforce that they should be following these lower carbohydrate diets. They'll have some component of carbohydrate sensitivity with it. Um, right now, you know, most or all of the medications that work for weight loss are injectables. Um, semaglutide is oral under the name Revalsis, but uh, it doesn't have very um, great effects for weight loss. Um, and so the other challenge is really the side effects. So lots of GI side effects, nausea, constipation, and heartburn are the most common. Um, rarely do folks get hypoglycemia, but I have, that come up, had come, have had that come up specifically for folks who are on concurrent insulin. Um, so you want to be very careful adjusting the dose for your diabetic patients. Um, you also want to use it in caution, or cautiously in folks who have gastroparesis and severe chronic constipation. It can be a pretty potent exacerbator of those conditions um, for folks that you put on it. So if you do use it in those the folks who have those issues, really make sure you're increasing slowly. And there was this fantastic review in Frontiers and Endocrinology from 2021 that um, really, they looked at all of the different areas um, that GLP-1 is being researched. Some of the more fascinating ones, this, reading this paper is kind of um, just mind-blowing because I think we focus a lot on the weight arena, um, but there are um, studies in mouse models going on that actually show that GLP-1 can potentially reduce the development of beta amyloid plaque in Alzheimer's disease and can also have impacts in Parkinsonism. Um, we know we we've, we've know that it's a pretty effective um, uh, you know, reversal agent for fatty liver disease and can really help um, mitigate that and prevent progression of that. Um, so a lot of, a lot of different areas that it works in. It has some cardiovascular protection effects. We think that there are some renal protection effects as well. Um, so there, I think that there will be a lot more coming out about the widespread benefits of GLP-1 receptor agonists um, as they act in multiple different areas of the body. So the first one is, um, it, you know, an older one, it's the laglatide or Trulicity. Um, it is a more modest weight loss agent. Um, it's actually not FDA approved for weight loss. It's approved for type 2 diabetes. But because of insurance coverage issues with the other ones, it's probably the easiest to get your hands on for a patient. Um, and so the Award 11 was a um, phase 3 RCT with about 1,850 patients who all were diabetic on metformin um, with body mass indices over 25. And so what we saw is that um, at the 36 and 52 week follow-up, um, you know, we saw a good bit of weight loss for these folks. At 52 weeks in the 1.5 dose, we saw 3.5 kilos. In the 3 milligram dose, we saw 4.3 kilos. And then in the 4.5 milligram dose, we saw 5 kilos of weight loss. And about 50%, when you get up to that 4.5 milligram dose, about 50% of folks are going to achieve that 5% weight loss. So not bad. If it's the only medication you can get your hands on, fantastic. Um, it is a weekly dosing, and you increase the dose every month when you're initially titrating it. Um, overall, pretty well tolerated. Most folks do pretty well on it. Um, it's just that it's less efficacious than other GLP-1s, um, so we really do try to get folks to the 4.5 dose if we can. I want to stress that if they're going to be non-responders, I think we um, sometimes tend to, you know, we tell patients, okay, you got to take this medication, it's going to work great. Be measured in terms of how you communicate to them, you know, that 50% that of people don't see that 5% weight loss at the highest dose. And so um, there's a good chance that it may help, but you, they may not get as far as they want to go with it. Um, now, the next of the GLP-1 receptor agonists is liraglutide. Um, and uh, it has more, it's more efficacious than, than the um, dilaglutide. The brand names, Victoza is a type 2 diabetes brand, um, and then Sexenda is actually branded for weight loss. So the Victoza goes to a max dose on those pens of 1.8. Sexenda is higher at 3 milligrams. Um, and the data for the 3 milligram dosing of liraglutide comes from the SCALE trial, um, which was 56 weeks long, about 3,700 patients. And they looked at liraglutide 3 milligrams versus placebo. Um, and as you can see here, so there in the placebo arm, we saw about 2.6% weight loss at 56 weeks, and the liraglutide arm, we got to an 8% weight loss. So fairly significant difference there. 
Um, this scale study actually extended to also look at outcomes in diabetes and sleep apnea. And fascinating, we saw that patients treated with um, loraglutide actually had improved AHIs, apnea hypopnea indices um, in sleep apnea. So very interesting. The LEADER trial looked at improved cardiovascular outcomes. So they really jumped off with this to kind of see where else are we seeing improvements. Um, so there's a lot of evidence out there um, supporting that it does improve those related metabolic comorbidities as well. Practically, um, the uh, liraglutide is difficult to get in this extended branded pens. They're pretty expensive, 900 to 1400 per month. There is a prescription assistance plan. You can get about $200 off if they have certain commercial insurances. Still very expensive. Um, we are very fortunate at Metro Health. We have the 340B plan, which allows us to get this medication for um, $10 a month for patients. And so we do, um, I end up putting them on a 1.8 shot plus a 1.2 shot to get to that highest dose of three milligrams. Um, it's a daily injection. So if you're doing two shots a day long term, it's pretty difficult. I would say my, my kind of like patients who are really into it and having great results, they can make it about 18 months and then they start coming to me asking for something else because it's just tough to do two shots a day long term. Um, and so when um, semaglutide hit the market, it was a real game changer. Um, so semaglutide is branded under Ozempic or Elon Musk favorite medication, Wagovi. Um, I don't know, he kind of, he, uh, in addition to breaking Twitter in other ways, he also kind of broke the internet when he uh, mentioned to people that that's something he was using to really, um, you know, kind of maintain his, his weight and his weight loss. So it's become very, very popular. Um, there's a lot of stuff on social media, on TikTok, things like that, um, talking about Ozempic and Wagovi. This is probably the most common medication I have patients come in and ask me about because it has become so popularized and, and mainstream nowadays. The challenge is, is that we have um, an Ozempic shortage currently, so um, they've had a lot of issues with production this past year, so it's become a lot harder to get it for patients. Um, and what, you know, kind of the good and the bad of it is it works fantastic. So um, it is the, one of the more effective GLP-1 receptor agonists. Um, the data we have comes from the STEP trial. So STEP-1 looked at 68 weeks of using um, the 2.4 dosing, which is the Wagovi dosing versus placebo. And we saw a 14.9% um, response, uh, weight loss response in the treatment arm versus 2.4% in placebo. And what I want to draw, this is a little blurry and I apologize, but coming over here in the in-trial data, it's 68 weeks. 86% of patients were getting that 5% weight loss. That is absolutely phenomenal. 69% um, at 10% uh, weight loss. They actually, very few of the other, um, other trials actually have, will have a bar graph for 20% weight loss. And here we're seeing 32% of folks are getting that 20% weight loss. So astounding results if we can get folks that 2.4 dosing, uh, the challenge is actually getting it for them. They also did a head-to-head -head comparison of um, semaglutide 2.4 versus liraglutide 3 milligrams, and the semaglutide well outperforms the liraglutide, so 15.8% um, versus 6.4%. So practically, um, what we tend to do, I, we're very fortunate at Metro, we're able to get the 340B um, price, which is this reduced cost formulary, um, and we're able to get Ozempic when it's in stock for $10 a month for patients. Um, some things you can do, you know, a lot of insurances will cover it if the patient has type 2 diabetes, um, you can get it, get it approved. Um, they have a 0 .25, 0 .5 starter pen for the Ozempic, a one milligram and a two milligram pen now. Um, so if insurance will cover it over time, I'll try to get them on that up to that two milligram pen. And this is how I walk them up to that. So we start with the 0 0.25 weekly for four weeks, and we really just follow that Wagovi titration pathway. So that's how the Wagovi pens work. The difference is the Ozempic pens, um, there's, you have to turn to select the dose. The Wagovi pens are preset. Um, and also the needle, the patient can't see the needle on the Wagovi pen, which is kind of nice. They actually have to attach the needle to the Ozempic pen. But fantastic medication has really been a game changer. Um, a couple of just pro tips and things that I've learned prescribing these medications because they're newer, um, you know, prior to my working at Metro Health and even my first couple years over there, we weren't utilizing them a lot. Um, so some things I learned um, and had to spend a lot of time Googling, so hopefully you don't have to. Um, so Trulicity and Wagovi, those two come in like a fixed dose pen with a needle attached. Um, the Ozempic has needles in the box, but the Sexenda and Victoza, you have to order the needles. And so just look up, if you're going to prescribe this, make sure you check that because you don't want to send the patient and have them, you know, then calling you back and saying, I have no needles or how am I supposed to inject this. Um, 
people can do injections in the belly or the thighs, but your higher BMI patients will often get a better absorption from the thighs. Um, and you can also use the longer needles if it's a needle that you're prescribing, um, the eight millimeter needles as opposed to the five millimeter needles for the higher BMI patients. So important to instruct the patients, these need to be refrigerated when they pick them up, but they should allow them to warm to room temperature before they inject them. If they inject them cold, it can be uncomfortable. Um, there's a lot of great online instructional videos at the manufacturer's website, so I will print the, the website address out and give that to patients. Um, and it's important to tell patients that they need to cut their portions in half ahead of time, really watch the carbs, and to eat slowly. I tell them 20 to 30 minutes. If not, you're going to get a lot of phone calls about how they feel nauseous because they drank some soda or they went out to Wendy's uh, because patients just really have, uh, you know, these medications give you a bit of an intolerance in general to those heavier foods, higher carbohydrate foods. Um, the other thing we often do is prescribe a bowel regimen ahead of time, get ahead on the potential for, for constipation for folks who are prone to that. Um, and then I still emphasize for patients, this really is paired best with healthy nutrition and exercise. All of the studies that were done implemented some kind of lifestyle modification plan. And so you can give it to a patient. Some folks just starting it, they'll see some initial weight loss, but you're not going to really see those optimal results unless we're doing those other, um, other interventions. And I just want to quickly mention there's... Um, because I want to have some time for questions. The terzepatide uh, medication is a new one targeting GLP-1 and GIP. Very interesting medication, fantastic results, only approved for type 2 diabetes at this point in time, but this is one we're certainly watching. Again, it's expensive. You can get it for diabetic patients um, via prescription assistance for $25 a month, but that only lasts for about a year. Um, and that, they have to have commercial insurance, so no Medicaid patients qualify. Um, so the future areas that they're looking at for medication development right now, oxytocin is a really interesting one that's had some promising results. Um, they're looking at GIP combined with the GLP-1, like the terzepatide, and how it, the GIP component can actually mitigate the nauseating effect of GLP-1 by binding the area postrema. Um, and then also a lot of work being done on kind of modulation of amylin receptors. You know, we used to use a lot more um, amylin uh, analogs, and now they're kind of coming back to that and looking at the role of the amylin receptor in the brain and how it mediates um, craving, reward, and appetite around food. So key points, obesity is a chronic disease. We need to treat it in an ongoing fashion. Medications can be an effective part of an obesity treatment plan, um, but again, it's about utilizing all the resources you have available to you. There's a lot of practical limitations on the current FDA-approved branded medications. They're often very expensive for patients, um, but we can use some generic and off-label medications in ways that we still get good results. Um, our average percentage of weight loss is going to be anywhere from 5 to 15 percent with medication. Um, and then just remember that folks who, who really need more than 15 percent weight loss have those higher BMIs, BMI over 35 with the comorbidity, think about bariatric surgery. Um, and then I just included the Obesity Society and the Obesity Medical Association, um, which both have a lot of really great resources if you're interested in learning more about this. All right, and I can take questions. That was awesome. Thanks so much. Um, I don't know if anybody has any questions or comments. You know, when I started my career, we would do big workups for men with impotence and the cinema urology and do all kinds of testing. You know, now we just give phospho diesterase 5 inhibitors. And it seems like we're maybe kind of going that way with the uh, GLP-1 agonists and obesity. You know, it seems like this is the new wave and these are so effective. What do you, you know, that's going to be the future? What do you think? That is, yeah, I, I think as of right now, um, I think that there is a lot of work being done. Um, you know, I just said Obesity Week in San Diego a couple weeks ago. There's a lot of work being done on novel targets as well. Um, I think right now um, the GLP-1s are a fantastic option. Um, the long-term usability of them, I think, you know, the Ozempic and Wagovi really opened the doors for that, but I think that um, some of the older agents that we actually are able to access for patients still have a lot of issues with long-term usability, um, especially when we're talking about potentially doing two injections every day for the rest of your life. So um, I think, you know, we, I still recommend kind of doing that underlying, you know, a lot of our initial history is looking at the underlying drivers of disease. Um, we definitely screen for underlying medical conditions that are driving disease. Um, but I think, you know, longer term, 
Um, I'm really hopeful that, that newer and better agents will continue to come out uh, because this really has been such a historically underserved population, um, you know, because of a lot of the, the moralizing that's been done around, uh, around issues of weight and issues of obesity. So, yeah, I agree with you. The GLP ones are fantastic. Um, you know, every time we get a new one, um, you know, it's more and more exciting and, and we can help more people and it's really changing the way we practice. Uh, but I'm hopeful that they continue that because I think there are still large portions of the population um, who have access issues with that. What, what so thank language, you very much. What language do you use, do you use with patients? Because the term obesity just does have this negative connotation in our society. So sometimes I'll talk to patients. I said, well, when you're talking about your elevated BMI, what, what, yeah, what language do you use? That is great. A lot of times I will ask. Um, some folks really do prefer the scientific terminology of obesity. Most do not. You are, you are correct on that. So I talk a lot about patients who struggle with weight or patients who struggle with, you know, who, who struggle with being heavier. Um, some patients like the term, you know, I have folks who use everything from the term like, you know, healthy fluffy um, or the term fluffy to refer to their weight. Um, some folks, you know, really do like that kind of medical terminology. Um, I, you know, and then and, and there's a lot of work going on right now about um, kind of reclaiming some of these words that have typically been used um, to, you know, shame patients who struggle with weight. And so, um, you know, there's, there's really right now, I think the landscape is shifting so much. I tend to just ask patients, um, you know, what do you call your weight or what do you, how do you prefer that I refer to that? And then I'll go based on whatever they tell me. Yeah. And there's a question in the chat about intermittent fasting. It seems like, you know, intermittent fasting is kind of in vogue. And I don't know if you remember when you were a resident, I was mildly obsessed with glycemic index. And there's a science writer, Gary Tobbs, who's written some really good books about uh, high glycemic index foods and diet and carbohydrate restriction. And so, so it seems like, you know, mm -hmm. Carbohydrate restriction and or intermittent fasting are intermittently in vogue, mm -hmm. and some people give their own subjective personal experience and success. I think the studies probably don't show. What's your take on those two approaches? That is fantastic. And actually, Dr. Armitage, you gave me a Gary Tobbs book as my graduation gift. So That's thank you right. for that. Um, <laughs> um, but uh, it's so intermittent fasting can be beneficial. There's a lot of evidence actually supporting it um, in terms of longevity and mouse models, um, reduction of chronic inflammation, um, you know, uh, normalization of hyperglycemia. So there is a lot of, um, th there seems to be a lot of benefits. Practically, um, when the, the studies in humans are pretty small, um, and so it seems to be that some people respond well and some do not, and there is a difference in sex. So females tend not to respond as well in general when they've done, they're small studies, but in general, they tend to experience more migraines and insomnia um, and, and other symptoms when they're trying to do intermittent fasting long term. Um, as opposed to as opposed to male, so we're not entirely certain what the the driver of that is. Um, I think it can be a, an effective strategy for some patients. So it's not for everybody. Um, sometimes meal skip it can lead to more meal skipping. It can lead to compensatory overeating down the line. But some folks really do feel like it gives them that structure they need. Um, so I'm all about trial and error. Right now, you know, we really don't have the data to say, um, you know, one style of eating is really the right way to go. And so if it's something folks have used in the past and have done really well with, we will use it. Um, if it's somebody who maybe tends to struggle with overeating, binge eating, um, you know, uh, we tend to stay away from that. And so it's really individualized based on the patient. But it's such a hot topic of conversation, um, you know, uh, unfortunately, you know, anytime I think that there's really significant polarization like that, and a lot of it's based on anecdotal evidence, it's a sign that we need more research in that area. Okay, thanks. We have another minute. I mean, we're a little bit over. A couple of people turned their camera on, and Dr. Chandra has his hand up. Dr. Chandra also is wanted to mention your doing good discharge summary from the NAF team. Just kidding. <laughs> Go ahead, Raj. Hi, hi, Catherine. How are you? Hello. Good to see you. Okay, welcome back. Uh, just a quick question, a sort of a follow up question to. Dr. Armitage's question about psychology of patients. How do they respond when you tell them that you actually have a disease, a chronic disease, as obesity as a chronic disease? That is a fantastic question. I think most patients, when I, I talk a lot about the physiology as well and how our bodies are designed to really um, gain weight and how they struggle with losing weight, 
and you can see this visible weight lifted off of people. There is so much internalized weight bias and shame um, that my patients come through the door with. I think most of the time they're expecting that I'm going to yell at them or be mean to them or, you know, uh, you know, kind of stand on a chair and wag my finger in their face and tell them that they need to do better. And so when you really approach these patients from a compassionate perspective and you tell them, um, you know, this is not your fault. You did not choose this. This is not a, something that you deal with because you are, you know, lazy or you lack willpower. You can see, you know, 50% of the time I would say my patients cry in our first visit because of that. It's just something that really they carried with them so significantly throughout their life and they, felt, they still feel so bad about um, and we do a lot of, I try to do a lot of work around reprogramming the language. So, um, you know, uh, encouraging patients that they do come in and, and they, they're coming at themselves with, you know, kind of judgment terminology, um, you know, or, or we're seeing kind of that weight bias show up towards themselves, really we'll, we'll pause and we'll try to reframe that in a way that's a little bit more neutral. Um, we talk a lot about how thoughts drive behavior and how if folks are you know, really approaching themselves with this deep internalized anger and hatred towards themselves over their weight, uh, that it's just not productive and it's not going to beget those changes that we really need to start to improve their health. Um, so that's a great question. I'd say most patients just feel so relieved and so, um, you know, what they've a lot of folks have expressed to me just hearing about it in that way really resonates with what their experience has been. Most of my patients have tried everything imaginable by the time they come to me. They've bought the supplements, they've done the diet plans, they've paid so much money out of pocket, um, and really they feel like they have deeply failed. Um, and so I think rewriting this narrative is one of the most important things that we can do for them. Awesome. There, and Dr. Green, I, I guess one more question because people are staying on the Zoom. Uh, Dr. Green, how are you attending with a lot of patients this week? Um, what do you provide in terms of exercise guidance for maintenance of weight? That is a fantastic question. Also very individualized. The guideline for weight loss maintenance is 300 minutes of moderately vigorous um, activity per week. Um, so I think, you know, that's, I, I don't get that much activity and I think about exercise and nutrition all day. Um, so it's, it's a lofty goal. Um, I usually try to meet the patient where they're at and try to get them doing something. So just increasing that from their baseline and we are continuously working on increasing that. The one thing that does come up a lot is the concept of resistance training, specifically for patient populations who are prone to lower levels of lean body mass. So um, my female patients, specifically postmenopausal females, um, anyone who's undergone bariatric surgery, um, and then my, my older patients as well, 65 and up. So I will work with them a little bit more intensely on specifically incorporating resistance work. Um, the University of Wisconsin, it, you know, most of my patients have never even thought about resistance work. It's a new concept to them. Um, and most people think that if they like touch a dumbbell, they're going to turn into a bodybuilder um, and look like John Cena. So um, we, we do a lot of talk up front about how that's not going to happen. And then I start them off with the University of Wisconsin. Um, they have a resistance band initial progression training on their website. Um, so if you just Google University of Wisconsin resistance band, fantastic program. People can do it at home. They can do it when they're traveling. All they have to do is, is get the bands, which can be purchased on Amazon for fairly inexpensive. Or you could just walk to and from work, but uh, just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. That works as well. Um, that we, works as well. We should probably wrap up. This has been a fantastic talk. You know, congratulations to you for the your, the success of the Metro program and the fellowship, and uh, you know the the UH residency CUE. Proud of you. So thank you so much for for coming back and educating us. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it.